welcome back, everyone. Um, as we move on to uh, a topic that's very much on people's minds, uh, I've invited two long-term friends who are also, uh, more importantly for all of you, Washington players. Uh, let me first introduce uh, Dr. Alice Rivlin, the director of the Engelberg Center for Healthcare Reform. She holds the Leonard D. Schaefer Chair in Health Policy Studies and, of course, is a longtime senior fellow in economic studies at Brookings. Um, Alice is an expert on fiscal and monetary uh, policy, on social policy, on urban issues. She was a founding um, director of the Congressional Budget Office in 1975 and served as its director until 1983. She's held every important budget economic policy post in Washington at one point or another in her career. Uh, she was director of OMB in the Clinton administration, vice chair of the Fed, president of the American Economic Association. Her PhD is from Radcliffe, and I say Radcliffe, a long story that she tells about her own career when she couldn't get into Harvard. They gave them their degrees, their economics degrees at, uh, through Radcliffe. Um, she's been a MacArthur Fellow um, and um, is one of... Uh, is really one of the big players in debt reduction and all these debt panels that have been, not death, but debt, uh, <laughs> that important. have been uh, going on in Washington. <laughs> Alice has either chaired them, co-chaired them, uh, been a member of them. Um, clearly one of the great um, budget and economic experts uh, in our history, Dr. Alice Rivlin. Dr. Diane Rowland is the executive vice president of the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. She reminded me to say it's not Kaiser Permanente, it's, uh, but both of, uh, most of us in health policy know uh, the Kaiser Foundation uh, very well. She's also executive director of the Kaiser Commission on Medicaid and the Uninsured. She's a nationally recognized expert on health uh, uh, insurance coverage on access to care on health care financing for low-income elderly and disabled populations. She's a member of the Institute of Medicine. Her doctorate is from Johns Hopkins in health policy and management. Uh, she's worked on congressional staffs on HHS. She testifies like Alice does on a regular basis on all of these issues. She's now chair of the Congressionally Authorized Medicaid and CHIP Payment Access Commission, which is called MACPAC. Um, and um, knows a lot about what Congress is thinking um, on these large programs. Um, I'm going to start with a, a, a different uh, approach, but uh, please welcome Dr. Diane Rowland. <laughs> so um, one of the things I always like to do and I try to get my students to do is to ask people what their own health insurance situation is. and. Uh, uh, let me start by asking Diane how she gets her health insurance, whether she gets it through Kaiser or uh, um, since her husband was a longtime federal employee, how she gets her health insurance. Diane? So I get my health insurance through Kaiser um, through one of two options. You can either choose Kaiser Permanente or you can choose Cigna. And being in D.C., I chose Cigna. And because Kaiser is a very generous employer, I have no employee contribution to my premiums. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I also am very well insured because my husband uh, is a retired federal employee, um, so I also have federal retiree employee insurance through Blue Cross Blue Shield. Alice? I'm old enough to be a Medicare recipient. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm also a retired federal employee, uh, so I have uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, which in D.C. is called Care First, uh, as a federal, former federal employee. But let me, let's get this in. I'm st though I work on things like accountable care organizations and uh, uh, other kinds of uh, delivery reforms, I'm still in the fee-for-service system. And I'm still very aware. I go to a, an internist practice uh, that's still paper-based. I don't have any way of getting 
the kind of electronic record uh, that the previous speaker was touting on the telephone. And we all ought to have this kind of thing. Uh, and I've been acutely aware that although I'm still compass mentis, I may not always be. And if you're in the, <laughs> if you're in the fee-for-service system, you're basically your own care manager. Yeah. Thank you. And I, um, I'm also a federal retiree and get my uh, health insurance. I don't take the university health insurance. Um, but the health insurance I get through the federal government uh, costs eh, pretty close to the same. Um, it is fee for service, but of course I use UM doctors and they want fee for service. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> and Pat Garrity is paying for it. <laughs> or the federal government's paying Pat Garrity to uh, provide me with it. But I thought that would be interesting. I make my students run around and I also ask employees to do it and ask everyone that provides them with a service what their own health insurance is. Because the only way it seems to me you really learn is by asking people what they pay, how their health insurance is delivered, and uh, they get a deeper understanding. And one of the first questions I ask my students is a series of questions about their own family's health insurance arrangements. And it, it actually does uh, a couple of things. It gets them to learn something about the terminology in healthcare. More importantly, it gets them in a conversation with their parents, uh, which they rarely do as freshmen or sophomores, uh, <laughs> about something uh, that involves their family. And inevitably, I get emails from parents saying they had never read their health insurance plan until their kids started asking them questions about the co-pays and, and what the coverage was. And in fact, one parent, who was the managing director of a major law firm, said he actually changed the benefit structure after having to answer those questions with his child because he hadn't read the plan that he was personally responsible for for the entire firm. Just a little trick that makes us, we can be conscious about our own health, but we also have, need to get people conscious about their health insurance plans. Okay. Let me uh, start with a question with Diane Rowland. And uh, that is, um, because Diane focuses very much on, on the uninsured, the Medicaid, um, and to a certain extent on the Medicare population, the most vulnerable in our society. Um, I want to ask her how the discussion in Washington is evolving, and maybe a little about what keeps her up at night, uh, because it's one thing to have the Affordable Care Act, but it's another thing to actually get people health care, and that's the kind of thing she focuses on. And um, she talks to Congress all the time, or they talk to her. They tell her what they want her to focus on. But you know, as, as you started this conversation, I was thinking about many of the conversations I've had or the speeches I've given about the uninsured. And one of the questions that I like to ask at an audience is how many people in this audience are uninsured and need health care insurance? And I was doing a talk for a number of newspaper uh, reporters, and they were covering the Affordable Care Act. And yet a lot of them are now freelancers, and a lot of them were uninsured. And I said, well, are you going to try and go on the web and get coverage? And I think we've seen some of the stories come out of that. But what keeps me awake at night is to try and figure out how the very lowest income and disadvantaged populations get access to the kind of early preventive care. We know that being uninsured leaves people to delay care, to postpone care and to often end up sicker and on the doorstep of our hospitals and healthcare institutions where they're more costly than if we got them early access to care. But especially what keeps me up at night is that we keep talking about the cost of covering people when in fact I think getting people under the umbrella, getting into the tent, allows you to then manage their care better, allows you to try and get them better access to care. But in the world of Washington, they keep also talking about who are our frequent flyers, who are these high cost, high need populations. And I think there, a lot of states have not focused on the fact that where their Medicaid budgets go are not to the children and some of their parents that are getting Medicaid coverage, but really to learning how to better manage the disability population and those who are dual eligible, who have both Medicare and Medicaid and need better integration of their behavioral services and of their long-term care services. So I think the real challenge that we're trying to raise with Congress is that it's not just raising the amount people contribute to the cost of their care that's gonna change behavior. It's changing the way the system works 
for people who are very vulnerable and at risk, and especially taking on the long-term care issues, which have been so ignored. And we just had out of the Affordable Care Act a long-term care commission that spent six months deliberating and really <laughs> came up with very little in the way of how to move forward except for saying we ought to need a uniform assessment for how to get coverage. So those are the real challenges. First, of finding and getting enrolling people and then finding the right delivery systems to put them in. I'm also staying up at night worrying a lot about as we move forward what's going to happen to the safety net, the on the ground facilities that have taken care of so many of our indigent population and remain uh, uninsured, remaining uninsured people in states that have not moved forward with the Medicaid expansion and especially the immigrant population which has been left out. Diane, um, let me ask you a little about the Medicaid because it seems to me that people are always talking about individuals when they talk about Medicaid when much of the money is being eaten up by nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the way states allocate and the way they're pressured in terms of how to spend their Medicaid money, a lot of it goes to nursing homes, not to individuals. Well, that's, that's one of the areas where I think we are seeing some real progress, rebalancing the distribution mm -hmm. between home and community-based services and the nursing home. There's a lot of uh, demonstration programs that were part of the Affordable Care Act that give states additional incentives to try and move more people out. There's more interest in trying to have community-based care where individuals manage more of their care. But it's still the fact that if someone is in a nursing home, that is a large expenditure. And we're looking particularly now at readmissions to hospitals have become a big cause celebre in Washington of how can we reduce that. And one of the big places where that goes on is back and forth between Medicare and Medicaid, between the nursing home and, and the uh, hospitals. And so I think really trying to figure out better models for how to do long-term care services in the community may help us reduce the reliance on nursing homes that we've had today. Mm -hmm. Alice, um, give us some context for where the discussion on cost containment um, is in Washington and the kinds of questions and whether it's really connected to improving health care as opposed to just, you know, reducing the debt and, and uh, cutting the cost of health care. How do you see it working out? The Engelberg Center did come out with a big report on bending the curve. You have to be a health care expert to understand it because it has, it's very dense in terms of, I was on it, so it's very dense yes. in terms of the recommendations. So would you give us some context for that? Diane has given us context for the um, the debate that's going on about Medicaid and about vulnerable populations? Well, there's several contexts. And let me start by saying I thought the last panel was just terrific. And the reason I thought so was thoughtful people were talking about real issues of, uh, that, that they knew something about and that they knew were hard and complex and they were trying to work through them. I know where you're going at And there's, <laughs> there is less of that in Washington than there should be. <laughs> I'm not a Washington basher. I have, as Donna said, been part of the uh, policy making establishment for a long time. And there are a lot of good people who are. But one of the problems at the moment, as you know, uh, is that many discussions, including health care, are dominated by simplistic ideological views. Uh, and every few minutes, it seems, the House of Representatives votes overwhelmingly, uh, at least all the Republicans, uh, to repeal the uh, Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, as they like to call it. Uh, that's silly. Uh, they don't say anything about what we would replace it with. Uh, uh, but uh, the, it's become the, the symbol of we've got to get rid of this terrible thing. Uh, and that's not the way you solve uh, problems. Uh, the, the Democrats are not blameless either. Uh, but um, the, uh, so that's, that's one thing that I'm very worried about, uh, that we have such a polarized and such a simplistic ideological approach. Now, back to the Engelberg Center. Uh, we are trying to work on uh, how do you actually produce better K-12 
care uh, for less increase in cost. I didn't say better care for less money, because I think over time we have to recognize, and not all politicians do, uh, that uh, health care is expensive and that there are forces that uh, are moving us in the direction of more health care and more expensive health care, aging for one of them. Uh, but uh, the uh, objective is can we produce better, uh, uh, measurably uh, more effective health care for a cost that is not, reduce, uh, not increasing so fast? Uh, as a budgeteer, the big worry has been that health care spending over decades has been rising faster than our economy is growing. Uh, now, at the moment, we seem to have a respite in that increase. Uh, and that hasn't actually been mentioned this morning. Uh, what uh, we're, we're, we are a very, uh, we do devote a very large proportion of our total production to the industry that we're talking about here. 17% uh, of our uh, whole economy, which is more uh, than uh, uh, quite a lot more uh, than most other developed countries that deliver good health care. Uh, and some of us have been worried about that going off the charts, going through 20 and 25 percent, and where is it going to stop? And even three or four years ago, when I was on the Simpson Bowles Commission, uh, the projections of federal health care spending were really scary because they assumed that this increase in spending was going to, uh, faster than the economy was growing, was going to continue. And that would drive Medicare and Medicaid and the other health care costs of the federal government up faster than revenues can grow. So we were facing a, a big gap, uh, increasing debt as a percent of GDP. And that looked really scary. Now, in the last decade, actually, uh, the health care spending increase has slowed. And it's slowed quite dramatically in the last couple of years. Uh, if you read the last health affairs, it, it's a, always a year behind. Uh, but uh, but uh, in uh, 2012, uh, uh, spending uh, for health care did not go up as fast as the GDP. That, for an economist, that's real news. But it raises the question. Uh, uh, are we in a, uh, why is that happening? Is it partly the recession? Yes. But is it partly some of the things that we have been doing to deliver health care more efficiently and more effectively, some of which were talked about this morning? It's not just uh, that we now have the government uh, sponsoring accountable care organizations. It's that the private sector itself uh, is picking up these ideas and running with them uh, of private exchanges and accountable care organizations, uh, as was emphasized in the first uh, panel. Now, uh, that's the good news, but there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't actually know, uh, talk about evidence-based, we don't actually know for certain how uh, effective accountable care organizations are going to be in delivering better care for less money. It sounds very hopeful, uh, but uh, there is, it, the evidence is slowly accumulating and it isn't all positive. So there's enormous amount of work to do, some, some of which we're working on at the Engelberg Center, uh, to try to figure out what are the models of healthcare delivery that actually work. Thank you. Um, uh, Diane, um, uh, your boss at uh, Kaiser has suggested that every time we debate healthcare, healthcare costs slow down. Correct. That, that if you look <laughs> at the cycle, every time we've gone through one of these healthcare reform debates, costs slow down. Temporarily. 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 And then they go back up. And then they go back up. But the issue is we've never seen what happens when you actually pass the law. And so now we've passed the law, so now we really are going to be tracking what 
goes on with health care costs. But I think the real truth is that out in the field, there's a lot of um, innovation going on. I mean, when I talk to state Medicaid directors, they're not talking anymore about how they can reduce physician fees. They're talking about how they can design new models for where to deliver services and that their big issue, and they call it the bipartisan issue, that coverage is the partisan issue in Medicaid and transformation of the healthcare delivery system is the bipartisan issue. That that's where they're going to put a lot of their influence and that's where they're going to try and move forward. And I do think that um, everyone is on this watch now. What happens to healthcare costs post 2014 and you know how much can we blame on the Affordable Care Act? and how much can we give credit to the Affordable Care Act for. But that's the point. We've got to get away from this blame right. thing. Right. Uh, and it's very prevalent it's, in the political it's, system. It dominates Washington. It dominates Washington at the moment. Uh, and uh, you start talking about something that you think is a sensible topic, and all of a sudden, uh, the politicians in the room are saying, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. Uh, we've got to get away from that. And, and they go back to. 2012 before anything ever happened and start attributing <laughs> things there. So I think it's evidence-based is going to have to be where we go. We've got to know and we've got to get data and have more transparency. And I, I reflected on the panel this morning, talked about that, about how the system is really working and what incentives are working and what aren't and how do we really get um, expanded practice out there. And one of the things that we know is that we want to provide more primary care. Well, how do we do that in the most cost-effective way? President Shalala has really worked with trying to work on the extension of uh, nurse practitioners and more use of a wide range of multitasking. Those are system changes that we really have to see put into place and hopefully they'll help hold down costs. It's interesting to hear uh, Diane talk about uh, innovation going on in the states with government programs, a government program like Medicaid, because there's not a lot of discussion about that taking place around the country. You'd think to hear some of the critics of the Affordable Care Act uh, that the president himself was sitting up there running the whole thing uh, as a centralized system. Actually, a great deal of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act uh, rests in the states. And there's also a good deal of flexibility. Uh, and there are states that are moving toward their own kinds of systems within the Affordable Care Act. Vermont says it wants to do single payer. I'm not quite clear what they mean by that yet. Uh, I think it's a work in progress. Uh, but Arkansas is, uh, as uh, well, I think uh, Diane knows more about this, Bobby, than I do. But they're moving to use their Affordable Care Act uh, funding uh, to uh, broaden uh, the system to, uh, to everybody in Arkansas. Let's get some examples. Why don't you talk a little about Arkansas and some of the things Ar that are Arkansas going on. Arkansas is, is really engaging in, in two kinds of uh, advances. It's first trying to do more of an all-payer system so that on the payment side, there's broad across the board understanding of how to change incentives. They're starting with cardiologists and trying to change the incentives there for how cardiology is practiced in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole payment system reform that began before the Affordable Care Act but has been spurred on by the Affordable Care Act. And then secondly, they're one of the states with among the lowest income eligibility levels for adults in the Medicaid program. And they've negotiated a waiver with the federal government so that they can cover the individuals up to uh, the 138% of poverty through their through the exchange and therefore get help with some of the subsidies and have a wraparound. But that one has an interesting spin. It has all the very frail and sick individuals will be pulled out of that and left in traditional Medicaid. So that in effect what they're trying to do is have a very healthy mix in the exchange and then with the poorer and, low, and more frail individuals, keep them in the Medicaid program. But it's a model that they're going to really evaluate because it really shows how can you integrate the poor population that's now covered through Medicaid up through the same stream 
as individuals who are in the Blue Cross and the other plans that are being offered through the exchange and in employer-based coverage. So I think what we're trying to see in these states, especially like Arkansas and others, is how do you have continuous coverage across the income spectrum and so there are no gaps in who's eligible for coverage. And then you can really start to change the way the delivery system works for everybody and not just for the insured population. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Go ahead. And I think the, the uh, takeaway is there's a lot of room for experimentation. Uh, and uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how different states uh, do this. But picking up on another thing that Diane said, uh, we tend, the, the enthusiasts for accountable care organizations, and I'm one, uh, tend to think uh, primarily in terms of primary care. Uh, but there are all sorts of issues of how you evaluate uh, what you do with particular specialties and how you bring them in to an accountable care organization in a sensible way. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're working with specialty groups on. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of work going on in specialty groups. There was reference in yeah. the last panel right. in specialty groups themselves, including the internal medicine group that has taken a mm -hmm. big stand on standard of care and, uh, uh, and a number of issues. Uh, but adapting that into the healthcare system, we still have a heavily fragmented system. Yes. Even with all these innovations, some people could argue the innovations add to the fragmentation in some ways. Um, and it's, it's not clear where it's going to end up, is it, Diane? I think the biggest word in Washington seems to be integration and care coordination. And that seems to be some kind of a magic word that's supposed to change the way health services are delivered. And I think that's a much more challenging concept than anyone's willing to accept. Mm -hmm. uh, we see, for example, in the Medicaid and Medicare program with the dual eligibles, a number of national demonstrations on how do you integrate their financing and their care. Could but you what, explain what the dual eligibles are? The dual no. eligibles are the very lowest income Medicare beneficiaries, the lower 20% of the Medicare population, who also have Medicaid coverage to help them with their long-term care services, with their premiums, and with their cost sharing. So if you think about sort of the frailest and oldest and most disabled in our population, that's and the, the poorest. The, and the poorest, that's the nine million yeah. dual eligibles. They are also among the highest spending part of both the Medicaid and the Medicare program. So when you look at those two programs and you say, where can we start to reduce costs? Everyone says, oh, well, if we could better manage the dual eligible population, we would have a way of reducing the fact that 1% of the population spends about 20% of all the dollars. Mm -hmm. However, in these demonstrations, are they really going to be able to show that they've actually integrated services for long-term care and behavioral health and medical care all into one organization? Or is it just an umbrella that has lots of separate contracts? Mm -hmm. So I think that the whole test out there is going to be, can we really help people to better use the healthcare system to integrate those services so that we're getting actual savings. The goal of the demonstrations is to reduce spending on that population by 5%, but I'm not sure any of the managed care plans that are taking on this risk are necessarily going to be able to do that. But there's a double goal. Uh, yeah. We've got to uh, assure ourselves that we are not just saving money. Uh, we're oh. actually producing better health care. And the uh, idea of uh, cooperation and uh, uh, specialties working together, patient-centered care, uh, is a very uh, attractive one, uh, that, uh, that it, we could save money and produce better care uh, if uh, specialties were brought together. Uh, but it, it's hard to work out in practice, and it's going to take an awful lot of serious demonstrations that um, will take several years to evaluate, and not all the news may be positive. Mm -hmm. We've got to try things and 
uh, reject the ones that don't work very well and keep going because this is not going to end. This is a conversation that uh, is going to go on forever. How do we deliver better health care uh, without the increasing cost? Okay, the president's about to deliver his State of the Union speech. And um, he calls the two of you up and says, um, you know, I've got to deliver this speech. Uh, what should I put in it about health care? What would you tell him <laughs> to continue this discussion? And then I'm going to ask you what the Republicans should respond. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I tell him that he really needs to talk about the fact that making health insurance available to Americans is important, that leaving such a large share of our population uninsured should have been and was one of the goals of the Affordable Care Act, and that the job now is really to connect people to better care and to get the health care delivery system that they turn to to be in better shape so they can provide the kinds of services they need. Mm -hmm. So it ought to all be about getting better access to health care and better health outcomes for the American population. Mm -hmm. I would tell him to emphasize uh, that uh, the first step uh, in improving the American health system was to make sure that almost everybody was covered. And that was what the Affordable Care Act was designed to do. Now, we couldn't blow up the whole system and start over. Nobody wanted to. So we were patching a patchwork system. We had most people covered by employers, uh, some people covered by Medicare, some people covered by Medicaid. We had a large group not covered by anybody. So we were filling in this hole and filling it in in a way that uh, built on the existing uh, uh, system. Uh, it's hard, he should apologize again for not having realized how hard the exchanges uh, would be to get up and, uh, up, uh, and running. But I, th I think the political system is ready for the message, uh, let's make this coverage uh, expansion work but then let's move on cooperatively together uh, across bipartisan, uh, cross partisan lines uh, to try to figure out how we deliver care better. And that's not going to be by government dictation. It's going to be by trying different models of delivery and seeing how they work. And the private sector is already doing some of this and uh, should be applauded for doing it. Um, context again, would you tell him also to make the economic case on how important health care is to the economy, to American business, that health care business is part of the dynamic part of the economy? Does he have to make that case too as part of this? Um, I'm not sure his credibility uh, uh, in saying that uh, is, uh, is the greatest. Um, but it should be obvious uh, mm -hmm. that it's a very large sector of our economy, uh, and uh, it's all got to uh, work better. Uh, I think one of the uh, myths about uh, health care reform is um, we can just uh, pay less for Medicare, but uh, that will shift the cost to the other uh, to the rest of the system. Uh, uh, or we can uh, cover more people, and that will shift costs to the rest of the system. Uh, the, uh, the point is it's all connected, and Medicare uh, especially can be a leader in payment system reform. Mm -hmm. uh, and these uh, if, demonstrations if they work, or even simple things like not paying for readmission to the hospital within a short period if it could have been avoided, uh, those things will spread to the rest of the sector. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I think the president's in a difficult spot now, uh, and he's just got to keep his chin down and keep going. Uh, but uh, he does have to emphasize that we've got to work together on how to improve things. It isn't just a yes or no question. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I, I think the president should also listen to some of the governors who have been yeah. successful in trying to both, not here in Florida, but in other states, move forward <laughs> on the Medicaid expansion. Um, and one of the governors who I think is particularly eloquent is the governor of Kentucky, 
who talks about what it meant for this the uninsured. He's a Republican uninsured. governor. He's a Democrat. Democrat. Yeah. But, but he has a Republican legislature. He's, he's a got Republican a Republican legis legislature. Yeah. But he talks greatly about how many Kentuckians were uninsured, what it meant to give them insurance and access to better health, how poor their health statistics are. But he also talks about jobs and what it has meant for the economy to implement in Kentucky the Affordable Care Act. Same argument made in Michigan by a Republican governor. And I think if you really look at the governors that are trying to move forward, they're seeing it as right for the residents of their state, an important improvement in the potential health outcomes in some of the states with the poorest health outcomes. And yet you look at the South, where we know health care is not always at the levels we want it. And those are the very states that aren't moving forward. So I think he needs to start making a regional argument as well as a national mm -hmm. argument. You know, it's interesting because the reason we got Medicaid is because Southern legislators, Wilbur Mills in particular, were trying to put money into the South. And so they forced Lyndon Johnson to take Medicaid with Medicare, and it was clearly a proxy for putting resources uh, into the South. And now we're faced with a different kind of um, attitude about that. Okay, now draft the Republican response to the president. Well, the first Republican response would be, we should repeal this. It's harmful to the American economy. It's harmful to the American people. We've heard that one before, but I would hope that we're beginning maybe to move to a period where some people are saying, okay, it is the law of the land. It's got a lot of issues and problems, and maybe we should go in and at least fix some of the things that are fixable. Mm -hmm. And that's been the real tragedy, I think, of the Affordable Care Act and the political environment that we've had. No major piece of legislation ever passes the Congress without lots of glitches and the need for at least technical amendments. There has been no chance ever, because of this partisan divide, to go back in and fix what were known to be flaws in the Affordable Care Act, drafting errors, other kinds of things that happened. And second, this whole law was, of course, litigated through the Supreme Court, so no one even knew uh, no one expected. I was in the court the day they said the Medicaid expansion was effectively an option, and no one even expected that that might be an outcome. So that it's been a very rocky road to prepare. And so I think the Republicans hopefully will begin to say, okay, but now that it's in place, and if people are actually signing up, we're going to be taking away a benefit if we repeal it, and we might need to go fix it. Given what you said about the states, could the Republicans also make an argument that changes in the legislation ought to shift more responsibility for, to the states for designing their programs as opposed to using the waiver process? Well, perhaps that would be true on the Medicaid side, but you know, on the Medicaid side in much particular. Of, uh, and maybe they would lift the deadlines for whether a state can rent the exchange or not. But the states basically made their decision about whether to go forward or not on either setting up their own exchange or on the Medicaid expansion based on where they were in the lawsuits and mm -hmm. where they were politically. And so I think the thing we need to look at is what happens in the 2014 elections and whether that changes the dynamic in any of the states. Mm -hmm. But the states already have so much responsibility for the Affordable Care Act that only on the Medicaid side would you maybe want to give a little more flexibility. Alice, you know Mitch McConnell and uh, John Bonnier. What would you tell them in terms of drafting the response? Don't pay attention to the crazies in your party. <laughs> uh, try, try, to cra uh, try to come across as wanting to solve problems and wanting to work across the aisle to do that uh, and uh, stop the blame game uh, that uh, is, I think, not going to be very effective of carried out uh, too far because too many people now actually uh, would lose if the Affordable Care Act uh, were uh, repealed and re sensible Republicans are beginning to understand that we need to make it better, uh, not repeal it. I think they could make a huge difference if they were to come across with a uh, constructive uh, set of here's how we'd like to uh, change things. 
Uh, we know we wouldn't get all of this in a negotiation, but uh, this is our constructive positive stance rather than it's terrible, let's repeal it. Mm -hmm. And are there elements um, of new legislation in health care that you think we know enough about? Uh, or should uh, uh, the Congress just basically stay away from any new legislation at this point in time? Well, I think that what the respite in the increase in costs has bought is time uh, to let the demonstrations, enhance the demonstrations, uh, enhance uh, the incentives to enroll in an accountable care organization, both for providers and uh, for uh, patients uh, or uh, beneficiaries. Uh, there, there aren't any at the moment uh, in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you can be uh, uh, assumed to be in a, uh, a accountable care organization if your uh, doctor is in one, uh, but you may not know that. Uh, there ought to be a positive incentive for uh, beneficiaries to enroll uh, Medicare beneficiaries in an accountable care organization and for providers to be in one and to uh, share in any, any savings. Uh, we've got to move toward that kind of a, of a system, but we've got to move carefully and see what's working and uh, what's uh, not. Uh, but so you're I not would, impressed with what Medicare Advantage has bought us in terms well, of system change? I think that Medicare Advantage is another good example. Uh, it is moving, but perhaps not fast enough, uh, toward a more uh, transparent and more competitive uh, uh, set of, of uh, uh, or way of operating. Uh, and uh, that also should be enhanced. Uh, mm -hmm. Medicare Advantage is a great uh, place to say, let's see uh, if we can enhance the competition, the opportunity for competition among health plans uh, to, uh, to bring the premiums down. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way it was set up, it was never uh, a true competition and- uh, No, it's just enticing. Yeah. Entice the uh, plans and it, to come back it, in. It, yeah. um, it, there may have been reasons for enticing plans to, to do it, uh, but they're there now, and it's uh, uh, a profitable place to be. Uh, so this is the moment to make it more seriously competitive. And I think there are other places where their uh, legislation might help. Uh, competitive bidding has not been really uh, very much uh, part of the Medicare scene uh, for, uh, for anything, for pharmaceuticals or for uh, durable medical equipment and so forth. Uh, and uh, we need to do uh, more of that. But I would not see this as a moment for uh, rushing in with a lot of new uh, legislation. Let's, mm -hmm. let's fix it around the edges. Diane? Clearly one of the areas where Congress is gonna need to make some decisions in the near future is about the future of the Children's Health Insurance Program. The CHIP program is funded through the end of 2015, and the authorization goes through 2019. But how that program interacts with coverage through Medicaid, with coverage in the exchange, is going to be one of the issues. And Congress has said, well, we want your ideas about what should we do. Should children be allowed to re be retained in a separate program? Should they be folded in? to the program with their parents, what kind of choices are there. So I think you're going to see in the coming years some hearings on the CHIP program and hopefully some action in both the House and the Senate to decide whether to extend it or how to mesh it into and the And I think program. your fundamental point is right now it adds complexity to um, enrolling people because the parents are one place, the kids are another yeah. place. CHIP has a waiting period for eligibility yeah. that nothing else has, so it needs to really be, be yeah. One other place that they're going to have to do something <laughs> is the famous uh, sustainable yeah. growth rate, uh, the SGR. Uh, and I think there's hope this year that we might get a permanent fix that is more sensible. Uh, what the, as you know, uh, the way the uh, law is written, uh, it would uh, require 
uh, a substantial reduction, uh, like 29% or something, uh, in uh, doctors' payments under Medicare. And uh, this Congress is the famous in, doc fix. The, yes, and so we've all every year we have a doc fix uh, that says, well, we can't do that. Uh, what do we do? Well, we just kick the can down the road. Uh, I think I think we kick the can be, uh, down the road in part because of your CBO rules, right? That we it's very expensive <laughs> to fix it long term. Sure. Well, it's it, it's you, expensive I because uh, I mean, you know, why is there a cost here? Right. Uh, uh, the cost is that the uh, it isn't the CBO rules. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's the law actually. Yeah. Uh, that That's a law. Uh, CBO the, law. The law says that you. You uh, start from where you are, and you start uh, uh, assessing how much something costs by how much does it change uh, the current law. And the current law is those payments go down by 29%. Right. That's where so we balance the budget. If you're, if you're going <laughs> to fix it, uh, it's going to uh, cost something. Right. But my point is, uh, three committees. <laughs> Uh, three important committees, <laughs> Ways and Means, uh, House, fin uh, uh, House Ways and Means, Senate Finance, and uh, Energy and Commerce in the House, uh, have, uh, have come together yeah, they have uh, an and, uh, with an agreement. And I think we're going to see uh, a permanent uh, fix, which may do something else. Uh, it may actually put in it some more incentives uh, for Medicare right. uh, to move toward uh, accountable care. Uh, and that, uh, that would be good. The big question, uh, which you're raising and you're teasing here, is how are we going to pay for it? Yeah. Uh, well, we could pay for that uh, with a list of things that would actually improve health care. Uh, and uh, there, there, people are working on lists even as, uh, as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, more progress toward bundled payments for post-acute care uh, and uh, other things might actually be health improvements that would help pay for the, for the right. doc fix. Let's go to questions. Um, I think we've got microphones in two places. Uh, introduce yourself and um, give us a quick question. Yeah. Todd Florin, uh, MD, uh, MBA, uh, University of Miami alumnus. We talk a lot, a lot about Medicaid expansion as a way of providing uh, increased service and access. Uh, the recent study in science that looked at uh, the population in Portland who were randomly assigned to receive Medicaid expansion had a 40% increase in the use of uh, emergency room visits. Yeah. How, how, do you, uh, how do you respond to that? And if you could also comment a little bit, because we talk a lot about ACOs, can you also mention uh, your thoughts about uh, insurance co-ops and the pilot programs that have been yeah. started? Diane? Okay. Well, the Oregon study is obviously um, one that we are all watching because it was an uh, experiment that we could see a control group in. Uh, the 40% increase, let's put it in context, though, that over an 18-month period, emergency room visits went from an average of 1 to 1.4. So as a, uh, you know, a 40% increase is still a pretty small increase when you look at that um, in terms of the base on which it was applied. But what we see in Oregon is a variety of things. So we shouldn't just take that one survey. We see that people's financial burden was tremendously reduced. We know that any time you give people health insurance coverage, Affordable Care Act will be no exception, that they tend to boost their use of services. Uninsured people use fewer services than people with insurance. Now, the question there is whether that insurance use is for a better purpose or it's just um, extra utilization. I think the real thing about the Oregon experiment that we ought to remember is that individuals tend to continue to go to where they've been going before, and it takes time to change the way in which people access and use the delivery system. So what the Oregon experiment says to me is that we have a lot more to do than just handing people a Medicaid card in terms of, of working with them on how to use the healthcare system, how to get them into managed care. It didn't speak at all to what the plans these people went into were doing to try and change their behavior. And so I think those are all the challenges that that Oregon experiment raises for us. I'm going to try to just handle all the people that are currently in line. Go ahead. Yeah, a couple of quick things. Um, 
anybody talking about doing anything about MedPAC, about the Medicare Payment Advisory Committee, where a high, a large majority of specialists decide that specialists ought to be paid way more than primary care physicians? Uh, that's one question. Uh, second question is, is anybody talking about the supply chain of sick people here? Uh, I mean, in other words, you could talk about the efficiency, our efficiencies in doing diabetic amputations, and that's interesting and valuable, but what about where do all the diabetics come from? Where do all the obese people come from? Why? Uh, yeah, there's wh a lot of that conversation. What, what then uh, is our plan for addressing the health of our population? Who wants to talk about MedPAC? Oh. Well, <laughs> I, mean, I can talk about MedPAC. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, as the chair of MACPAC, which is not MedPAC, but set up in a comparable way, I mean, I think the, the issues there are um, that the GAO makes the appointments. The appointments are set out in statute, and they really do reflect a wide variety of individuals to be on uh, MedPAC. And I would encourage people who have concerns with how MedPAC behaves to write to their chair, Glenn Hackbarth, and say, uh, you know, I think MedPAC should be looking at issues in a different way. Yeah. Um, next, over here. Can, can we get to the wellness question? Sure, or? why don't you get to the wellness uh, I, I think uh, yes is the answer. There are plenty of conversations going on about how uh, we uh, reduce the uh, flow of sick people, as you say, and concentrate more on health and wellness. Uh, but uh, it's not obvious what the answers are here. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, and it's not primarily a health care system problem. Uh, it is what communities can do uh, to... And employers. And employers. Uh, it, it's, uh, and what individuals can do on their own, and how do you incent it? Uh, one of the uh, things that I've been working on with uh, my colleague Mark McClellan and a... a a commission on a healthier America is what are the main things we can do to make America healthy, healthier? And they're not health care. Uh, they are a very heavy focus on early childhood and uh, getting children not uh, growing up in highly stressed uh, environments, which are very bad for their long run health. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, how do you get community development that, that leads to healthier communities? Uh, if you're not having your development people and your uh, health people working together, uh, you don't really end up with a healthier community. Uh, and if you want people to exercise, uh, they need to be able to go out the front door and find a place where they can walk. And if you want people to eat healthier food, they need to have access to healthier food. They can't live in a food desert. So those are the things that people are working on, uh, but uh, they aren't to do with health care. Yeah, but the, the big jumps were clean air, uh, uh, immunization, um, uh, building codes, I mean, those yeah. early uh, public health moves. But there are lots a, of other jumps to be made. Yeah. yeah. Uh, over here. Uh, good, good morning. My question has to deal with how the middle class continues to be squeezed. From, a, from a every perspective, when you start looking at all the issues pertaining to insurance, to coverage, to wellness, the middle class is the one that is really squeezed. And I don't see any plans that take care of that group who are the ones that are going to be our, our, our future besides our kids? Alice? Well, in the, first, broader economic in question, the yeah. first place, um, yes, you're right. Uh, there's, there's been a big squeeze on the middle class. One of them, we need the economy growing faster and more jobs and better jobs. Uh, but um, if you're thinking in the health care context, uh, the Affordable Care Act subsidies reach well into uh, the middle class, and part of, of taking the burden off the middle class is getting people able to buy health insurance that they uh, can afford. Uh, the Affordable uh, Care Act is, uh, in the exchange part of it, uh, primarily uh, aimed at the middle class, not at the very, uh, not at the very poor. 
Uh, but the other thing that's going to help the middle class and everybody uh, is finding a way to, ways to deliver health care uh, more effectively for less money, because in the end, we all pay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, my name is Kevin Nella. I'm a biomedical engineering student here at the university. I'm considering medicine, but I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> uh, with this huge influx of patients into the field, or into uh, hospitals and all that, um, the problem that I see is that there are not enough doctors. Even right now, I was shadowing a doctor last summer, I saw that he had 15 minutes to see three patients. The next 15 minutes, he had another two, and then and so on. So if you have this much of an increase of patients and that same level of doctors, how is every patient going to get the same amount of time that he needs to see with their doctor? Well, and how are you going to incentivize yeah. people to get into medicine? Because right now, it's not an attractive field, especially yeah. in primary care. Your, your life sucks, and you're not getting that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, it's pretty, I think the answer is pretty straightforward. Uh, number one, the, there's a major increase in applications to medical schools, so the kids aren't, more people are going into primary care. But the fact is that we have to use all of the healthcare professionals. And that means not just advanced practice nurses, but physicians' assistants. We have to integrate pharmacists into the healthcare system. And uh, we don't need primary care physicians to do a very large percentage of the healthcare. Uh, they ought to be used. Um, up to their own training, and we need to use every person in healthcare up to their training. That means we've got to break down scope of practice, and we can't just concentrate on just increasing the number of doctors. We've got to use every part of the healthcare system. Um, there are plenty of nurses that can do plenty of that primary care uh, in this country, and until we understand that this is a team effort, which the Accountable Care Organization uh, clearly help, but the healthcare system is being transformed as, as people within the system are working up to their licensure, but more beyond their licensure up to their training, and we will have a way uh, to account to all these new people we're bringing in. And to answer Alice's question about how do we get more quality um, at the same time, we do it by developing a seamless system and using people up to their training. But that is a question of state law. It's state law. Uh, Licensure is not, state law. Scope of practice is state law. It's breaking down across the country. The state that allows people to work right up to their licensure uh, and has expanded that licensure right up to people's training is New Hampshire. It doesn't have to do with red or blue states. It has to do with his history in the states. But scope of practice is breaking down across the country as governors and state legislatures begin to recognize that they're training health care providers and then not letting them use their skills or their training. And I think that over the next five years, you're going to see a dramatic change in who does what in health care at the same time. Let's get the question over here. Uh, thank you for clapping. Um, <laughs> I'm Matthew. I'm an undergraduate here at the University of Miami. And uh, we were talking about Medicaid expansion. And yesterday, I was at the Med Campus, and uh, Secretary Perez came and mentioned it was uh, costing Florida billions of dollars. And I was wondering if you've seen any obstacles that have been created in other states because of the refusal of the Medicaid expansion. And a lot of the states have that have refused it, I don't like, really see the political climate changing, and they're going to suddenly you know, start accepting it over the next round of elections this year. So are there any uh, ways around the Medicaid expansion to overcome those obstacles that have been created because of these states refusing the Medicaid expansion? I think there's a lot of discussion going on. Diane, uh, do you want to talk a little about, uh, there is discussion going on with a lot of these states that have said no initially. Yeah, I, I think two things are important to remember. First of all, in addition to the expansion, every state had a lot of opportunity and requirements to change the way they do eligibility, the way they do enrollment. So even in a non-expansion state, we're going to see a lot of people who were previously eligible but not enrolled, especially children, coming into the system. But the second thing is we're looking now at the impact on the safety net facilities in the states that have not chosen to expand because there are still going to be uninsured people who are going to need lots of services. They're still going to show up at hospital emergency rooms. They're going to show up at um, clinics. 
and there, we need to look at better ways to try and get them into systems of care. So how can we reorganize some of the safety net facilities, knowing, though, that their, their funding is going to be dramatically reduced. So there's a lot of effort in some places to try and raise philanthropic funds to help fill in some of these gaps, but really nothing can fill in them to the extent that the funds which would have come through the expansion would have helped. And we may see some states switch. Uh, it is so self-defeating for a state uh, to say uh, we're going to stand on principle and not take that federal money that helps our citizens uh, that I think that's wearing thin in some places. Well, it's also wearing thin as some states sit there and watch the state next to them getting all these additional funds and starting to really expand coverage. And I think that the administration, it's an area that um, if we still had Secretary Shalala, there'd probably be a lot more negotiation going on <laughs> uh, about how to do some of these waivers to give states the ability to move forward without having to do the full scope of what's in the Affordable Care Act. But I think ultimately uh, the goal is, of course, to have a seamless eligibility system so that the poorest of the poor can actually get care. And one of the tragedies is that we're leaving 5 million uh, very poor people below the poverty level uh, without health insurance because of the states that haven't moved forward so and far. I think there's an important point. That this is also part of the business of health care. The people in the health care business are talking to their states and working with them to see if there's a way to get them in because um, a lot of this money, this is not only the provision of care for uh, individuals that are uncovered, this has a lot to do with the health of the healthcare business in these states. And that means there's a different political constituency for taking uh, the resources and that we believe in the long run will make a difference as long as the feds are somewhat flexible um, and are willing to engage in these waiver discussions, which they seem to be, but uh, they also seem overwhelmed with some of the other parts of the care. They almost need SWAT teams uh, to go around and, and, and try to do a lot of this. And elections do matter. I mean, in the state of Virginia, which was a no state, we now have a new governor that was just sworn in who ran on expanding the Medicaid program as part of his um, campaign. So I guess my message to everyone would be don't forget elections matter. and who your elected representatives are and where they right. will take you are very critical issues. Hi, um, my name is Rafael Diaz. I'm from the FAU Healthcare MBA, currently at AFMED Health. Uh, my question, I guess, is a, is a bit of a two-part <laughs> question, and, and it really combines, I guess, the entire panel's expertise on this. Um, so my apologies, I guess, for being slightly rotund, but um, it, it really stems for everything that we've talked about, all these changes coming forth and everything. It's not the first time that we actually encountered them. I mean, some of us might even remember but not necessarily from a personal experience, but you know, having seen uh, Kennedy's speech when he first tried to pass you know, uh, changes in legislation, and we saw the AMA as one of the biggest proponents against um, these changes. Uh, something I've always said is we can't let the lack of perfection be the enemy of progress, but yet okay, here what, we are. Uh, you want to give us the question? Yeah, the question is, you know, given everything that's going on and seeing that we've been in the past going through, you know, stumbling upon the same rock, um, what's really different now aside from the actual healthcare, healthcare law changing, and that tied into economics. Uh, we're seeing, you know, we know that the um, populations with the lowest income usually have the least access to care, and we see that influx now going in. But what's going to happen afterwards, after everything settles down and we get over this hump? Mm. Well, I think that speaks to the basic point that uh, once you get broader coverage. That's the opportunity uh, to get away from the conversation about who's going to be covered and who's not uh, to how do we improve the delivery system, which is the conversation uh, we're trying to have. It, to me, the passage of the Affordable Care Act was the end of arguing whether people should have coverage right. and the beginning of trying to figure out how to move forward and get them better coverage at a lower cost and, and better value. Uh, the Supreme Court decision that left the Medicaid issue open is still the remaining stumbling block. But I think over time, it took a long time to implement the first Medicaid expansion in 1965. Not all states came in at the same time. And hopefully, over time, we'll see that uh, gap filled. And I think another significant thing is that has changed is the, the uh, representatives of the health care industry didn't fight the Affordable Care Act. 
the previous attempts, either the insurance companies or back way back when the doctors uh, and the hospitals were were fighting the expansion of coverage. Uh, but the health, the entire healthcare industry has really gotten to the point where it accepts we need to cover everybody. Uh, they're not always clear about which, uh, how to do it, but uh, that's become accepted uh, by the people who have to be part of the system. I and guess the other big hard difference hard. is that this is a law. It's not a proposal we're still debating. Yes. It's actually the law. Yeah, it does yes. help though that the population that's uncovered gets up every day and goes to work, work. for the most part. That, that this is a working population that just doesn't have access to coverage. And so the politics is very different and that are, surrounding it. And that are potential customers exactly. of uh, the of healthcare the business, system. Of, of the, the business. business of healthcare. Yeah. I'm afraid I have to end there. I'm getting the hook, even though I'm president. They the hook. Thank you. Uh, what, no power? Uh, no power. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much to our very distinguished panelists. <laughs>